According to some reviews, Princeton is one of the most beautiful campuses in America. Just take one look at the brochures and you'll see it. You see smiling students laying nonchalantly on the perfectly manicured Princeton grass. You'll see them playing hacky sack, reading a book, or laughing uncontrollably with friends. You'll see students with a range of complexions and ethnicities, sitting and discussing scholarly text in front of ivy-covered, Harry Potter-like buildings. These images jump off the page, successfully luring hopeful, intelligent students like myself. It was my desire to be on this campus that caused me to stay up long past midnight during late night study sessions and energize me for 5.30 a.m. waking times. And then the moment of reckoning came. I received an email with the Princeton Tiger in its header. I read further and it said, congratulations. I didn't know what to do, so I awkwardly and gleefully jumped up from my family's computer in the den and darted up into my room in an adrenaline rush of excitement and disbelief. If you had seen me, you would have thought that the tiger had jumped out of the page when I clicked open. <laughs> Several weeks later, Princeton's admissions office sent me a plane ticket to come and visit. When I first saw the lovely spring blossoms and the beautiful architecture for the first time, I was in awe and I thought I had won a lottery ticket. I fell in love with the three underground floors and four above ground floors of Firestone Library and all of its books that had been in circulation since the 1800s. And while I was on this visit, I didn't really think to ask about campus diversity. Now, I'm clearly aware of my race and gender, and I know that racism is a problem, but at that time, race was not something I thought about that much. I was a straight-A student with dreams of becoming a medical journalist and a surgeon. I went to a majority white high school in upstate New York, and I had white friends, and while at times I felt awkward because I couldn't fully relate to their experiences, for the most part, we got along. But at Princeton, it was quite a different story. It all started during my freshman year. I received my first D ever. It was in chemistry. Now at that time, my high school didn't have an honors chemistry class. And so I didn't know the amount of preparation that would be necessary to do well in a college level science course. So you can imagine, I was ashamed and devastated when I received my first semester grades. But wait, that's not all. Caribbean Connection and Black Student Union hosted a party that semester. They invited students from surrounding New Jersey colleges. During that party, a fight broke out between some non-Princeton students. Police descended on the scene and sprayed pepper spray indiscriminately, and chaos ensued. The Daily Princetonian later covered the story. When I read the comments section, and here's some advice, never read the comments section online. <laughs> My spirit was crushed. Comments like, black students shouldn't be here, prone to violence, and move in packs, caused anger in the spirits of my friends and I. After that, incidents, these racially charged incidents that never seem to find their way into elite college brochures, seem to happen on a regular basis. Comments about affirmative actions soured my feelings towards the acceptance letter that I once cherished. There was the fact that it seemed like so many of my peers were unaffected by national news that Rakia Boyd, Ayanna Jones, Trayvon Martin, and so many others were being unjustly killed. There was that time someone tagged the campus elevator with the N-word. There was the growing and unaddressed concern over Princeton's constant celebration of Woodrow Wilson's legacy on campus, despite his widely documented racist beliefs and actions. And then, there was a pushback that I received when I tried to declare African American studies as an independent major, because according to the dean's office, it was an illegitimate area of study. 
This was not the Princeton that I had dreamed of from the brochures. Being surrounded by students that talked about places I had never been and went to private day schools and boarding schools that were equally as expensive as Princeton's tuition caused me to feel uncomfortably aware of my economic status and caused me to question my intelligence and belonging. On top of that, I was worried about things at home. The 2008 economic downturn impacted my family, like many families. So I was very uncomfortable with my unlimited meal plan and nice room all to myself, while back home my family was figuring out how to keep things together. I didn't know how to manage the difficulties I was facing, and I didn't know how to ask for help. So my depression and anxiety culminated in a stay at a mental health facility just before winter break during my sophomore year. I came to hold the belief that Princeton was a terrible place and that I must get home as soon as possible. I thought college was supposed to be free of racism and all the other isms that cause division in the larger world. So, I thought maybe I should take a semester off or a year off, as I had seen other students do, but I was too afraid to do something like that, so I decided to push through. Fast forward to graduation. When I received my diploma, I was feeling relief, but sadness and regret. But everything happens for a reason. The pain and problems I experienced at Princeton were probably some of the best things that could have happened to me. My experiences at Princeton fuel my current work to advocate for racial justice, educational equity, and social impact. Since graduation, I've chosen to work in the nonprofit sector. Currently, I work full-time as an academic coach for colored students of color who are college-bound. In my work helping my students develop academically and professionally, I've been able to be, make some revelatory and healing observations. I've been able to see the value in students of color coming together to convene. When my students come together, they're able to talk to each other and our staff about their experiences. We help them make sense of everything from whitewashed history books to a lack of diversity amongst their teaching staff. After they vent about whatever it is that makes them uncomfortable, we challenge them to advocate for change. What's more, I've been able to watch my students develop intellectually and understand more about their identity as they take college-level courses in topics surrounding race and difference. I make sure that my students are taking the right classes I make sure that they're asking for help, and I push them to use their support systems. I'm confident that my students will walk on their campuses empowered. I know that they will be aware of the potential setbacks and difficulties they may face, but they'll be able to digest it, accept it, and take the appropriate action. Now, when my students ask about Princeton, I'm able to set aside all my personal experiences and tell them to apply. I'll tell them that it might not be exactly like the brochures, but when they get there, they ought to walk with their head up and shoulders back. That they're equal to everyone they may encounter, from super wealthy kids to Nobel Peace Prize winning professors. Now there are some things that us caring adults can do to make sure these highly selective colleges, or any college for that matter, is welcoming to a diverse set of students. Let's make sure that our students are pushed academically because they're capable of far more than we think they are, and this is the only way they'll be able to keep up in college. Let's teach them how to ask for help. And let's make sure that we teach institutions not to wait to be asked. And let's expose them to their identity, teach them their history, 
and show them the greatness of people who look like them. Let's make sure that our students' higher education dreams come true. Let's make sure that their experiences are beautiful beyond the brochures. Thank you. <laughs>